Hello, and welcome to Maths on the Move, the podcast from plus.maths.org. I'm Rachel Thomas. Now, Marianne Freiberger, my co-editor of PLUS and partner in crime, and I are getting really excited because next week is the International Congress of Mathematicians, one of the highlights of the mathematical calendar. The ICM, as it's more succinctly known, takes place every four years and it's usually the biggest maths conference of them all, attracting thousands of participants and also seeing the awards of some of the most prestigious prizes in mathematics, including the famous Fields Medal. Now, this year is going to be a little bit different. It was originally scheduled to take place in St. Petersburg in Russia. But with the war in Ukraine, plans obviously had to quickly change. And this year, the ICM will be a hybrid conference with an in-person event for the awarding of the prizes and the prize lectures taking place in Helsinki next week and the rest of the schedule of really fascinating talks from across the full spectrum of maths taking place in the following days online. Now, we are really fortunate to have been able to interview prize winners in advance of the conference this year, but that's top secret, so we won't be revealing the winners till they are announced publicly in Helsinki next week. But it's been really good fun meeting them online and learning about their work, and we're really looking forward to sharing our interviews with them with you all next week and meeting them in person in Helsinki. And we'll bring you all the news from the ICM itself next week. But in the meantime, to get us in the mood, let's revisit the 2018 ICM that took place in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. It was a beautiful setting and it was a brilliant conference. So exciting and so vibrant. And the podcast you're about to hear was recorded on the very first day of the 2018 ICM, when all the big prizes were announced. You can find all our coverage of the past three ICMs by going to plus.maths.org and searching for ICM. You'll find their articles and podcasts and videos that we hope will really capture the excitement of the events. And... Stay tuned for our special series of podcasts, Maths on the Red Carpet, that start next week that will bring you all our reporting from this year's International Congress of Mathematicians. It's going to be an ICM unlike any other and we can't wait to find out what it has in store for us and to share it with you. But for now, let's enjoy the sounds of the Brazilian forest in this podcast, revisiting the exciting first dates of the 2018 ICM. Hope you enjoy listening to it and see you next week in Helsinki. These are the beautiful sounds of the Brazilian rainforest as we heard them yesterday at the opening ceremony to the International Congress of Mathematicians that is taking place in Rio de Janeiro at the moment. My name is Marianne Freiberger and I'm here with Rachel Thomas and we're from PLUS magazine, plus.maths.org. We're here reporting on the Congress and yesterday was the first day, which in some ways is the most exciting day because that's the day that with the opening ceremony they announced the winners of the big prizes, including the Fields Medals, which are some of the most prestigious prizes in mathematics. The Fields Medals are awarded every four years and they're awarded up to four mathematicians and the winners this year were Kautja Berka, Alessio Figali, Peter Schultze and Akshay Venkatesh. Marianne, you read up about the work of Alessio Figali. Um, do you want to tell us about it? Yeah, so perhaps the easiest thing to explain about um, Figali's work is something called optimal transport theory. And as the name suggests, the motivating question for that theory is like given a distribution of stuff, how do you best transport it from one place to another? It turns into quite a deep problem in the theory of mathematical functions involving things like integrals and probability measures and so on. So um, yesterday we went to a press conference where most of the Fields medals were present and we asked Alessio to describe optimal transport theory in his own words but also to give us some idea of what other types of mathematics he works on. 
So Optimal Transport is this um, theory which has a, you know, a dignity on its own. It's about transporting resources from one place to another in the most efficient way. And uh, I've been using it quite a lot uh, in several applications, like I mentioned in uh, um, supermetric problems and also this movement of clouds. I mean, these are partial differential equations. But it's not the only thing I do. I've been working also on other kind of problems, like free boundary problems, uh, application to probability as a result in dynamical systems. So, of course, I try to emphasize some of the, you know, uh, also the topics that I can describe more easily to the general public at the same time. And also, I like it very much. It's, this was how my um, PhD started, was big central optimal transport, so I still keep optimal transport in my heart. <laughs> Yeah, so as Alessio mentioned there in his um, clip is that um, optimal transport theory is a mathematical problem that you can investigate from a sort of purely mathematical angle, but there are also applications, and that's sort of obvious because it is about transporting things, but the applications can be a bit surprising. So, for example, some of the work that um, Alessio Figali has been doing has applications to meteorology because if you think of little cloud particles moving around and you want to know exactly how clouds evolve, so you want to know where these and how these particles move, and it turns out that that actually is amounts to solving an optimal transport problem. So that's quite an interesting applications angle. Now, Rachel, you've been thinking about Akshay Venkatesh's work a bit more. Um, can you tell us about that? So I was quite excited about Akshay Venkatesh winning, partly because he went to the same university as I did, and we actually crossed paths, though I didn't know him at the time, I must admit. But still, it was really exciting to have a winner from the university that I went to when I was a student. So Venkatesh's work is in number theory and one of the things that's interesting about his work is he kind of has spent his career exploring the boundaries of number theory with other areas. Um, one of the things he is being recognised for is this work he's done on something called L functions which are generalisations of something called the Riemann zeta function which is the thing behind this very famous open problem in mathematics called the Riemann hypothesis. And what the Riemann zeta function tells you about is the distribution of prime numbers uh, amongst other numbers, and it sort of revolutionised our understanding of uh, prime numbers at the time in the 19th century. And now L functions, this object that uh, Venkatesh studies, is uh, sort of a pivotal object in number theory today. In the press conference yesterday, we asked Venkatesh about how his work related to the Riemann zeta function and the Riemann hypothesis. In terms of what it tells us about prime numbers, um, it, it doesn't, I would say it doesn't directly say a lot. Um, it, it's, there is a belief that all of these generalizations, the Riemann zeta function, behave in a similar fashion. And, and that's sort of a surprising thing. And uh, I would say it's, it helps to, it's part of um, establishing that. But it doesn't say very much useful about prime numbers. So the Riemann zeta function we can access in many ways. And uh, some of the generalizations are, there are fewer paths. To understanding them. Venkatesh uses something called hyperbolic geometry to understand these L functions that he was talking about. Hyperbolic geometry is a special kind of geometry in which instead of being flat like we're used to, it's curved, but it's curved in such a way that the angles of a triangle, for example, don't add up to 180 degrees, they add up to less than 180 degrees. So the sides of a hyperbolic triangle curve inwards. These hyperbolic triangles can tile a hyperbolic space, and there's a surprising connection between different areas of mathematics using these. And we asked Venkatesh a little more about this. I think it's a great surprise that we, do, we don't... This is an empirical fact that hyperbolic... Certain features of hyperbolic geometry are related to number theory, but we don't have a... We don't know why. Uh, that's part of what makes it very interesting. 
Sadly, not every one of the Fields medalists were there at the press conference. Um, people might have heard that, unfortunately, Couch Berker's Fields medal was stolen shortly after the presentation ceremony. But Marianne, you were looking into Berker's work. Yeah, I was very sad not to be able to ask him questions, but we're hoping to catch up with him for an interview later during the week anyway, or next week too. But Berker works in algebraic geometry, um, and essentially he works on the problem of classifying something called algebraic varieties. So we're all familiar with the fact that if you have a simple shape like a line or a circle in your classical coordinate system, then that line or circle can be described by an equation. So a line... The equation y equals 2x plus 1 describes a line with slope 2 um, that hits, that crosses the y-axis at the point 1 in the vertical direction. And a circle could be described by something like an equation like x squared plus y squared equals 1. So these circles and lines are examples of algebraic varieties because they are shapes that are determined by equations. Now you could look at even more complicated polynomial equations or sets of simultaneous polynomial equations over the complex numbers, for example, um, not just the reals, and then you get a general notion of algebraic variety. And one of the things that mathematicians want to do when they have a big cl infinite class of objects like algebraic variety is to classify them in some sort. And there's a notion of birational geometry, which is about classifying these algebraic variety according to a particular principle that involves something called birational maps. The general hope in the area is that that classi classification system will enable us to understand each algebraic variety in terms of a simpler one made up of just three components. So it's in this area that Berke has made groundbreaking contributions. So it was sad that we weren't able to talk to Berke yesterday, but one person who was at the conference is Peter Scholze. He's a German mathematician, um, and he's receiving his Fields medal at, the, medal at the tender age of 30, and he's perhaps something like a superstar of this year's ICM. Now, Rachel, you've read about his work, so can you tell us something about that? Scholze has um, been awarded the Fields Medal for his work in, um, again, in algebraic geometry, um, and he works with something called piadic numbers, which we asked him a question about in the press conference. So I'm primarily interested in number theory, and number theory deals with the integers, with the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. And, for example, whether equations can be solved in the integers. And for this, it turned out that, I mean, usually when you learn more and more numbers in school, you first learn the integers and the rational numbers and then the real numbers. But actually, there's a different way to somehow complete the rational numbers into something bigger. Um, and that is called the periodic numbers, and where the notion of distance is not the usual notion of distance, but instead two numbers are said to be closed if their difference is divisible by a large power of a certain prime number. And so if you form a similar uh, completion, you get the so-called periodic numbers. And for many arithmetic questions, it's much better to think of the rational numbers as being a subset of these periodic numbers. And so I'm using them to solve uh, problems in number series. One of the things that Schultze is being recognised for is his development of something called perfectoid spaces, um, which is a real testament to the vibrancy of, of mathematics, because he only introduced them in 2011 when he was only 23. Um, and despite being such new maths, they've, this concept's already had a big impact both in people using them to prove open problems in algebraic geometry, but also in other areas. And in a way, it kind of connects the areas of things like topology, which is the shape, study of the shape of objects, to Galois theory, which is the study of how symmetry can be used to solve equations, and to piadic geometry, which is the thing that Schultz was working in, um, which inspired this problem. And the other thing that was nice that he said, actually in the film created um, to recognise the Fields Medals, was he recognised the importance of finding the right language to describe his problems. And that's a really nice point, I think, that he was saying once you find the right description of the maths you're trying to think about, suddenly the way to solve the problems becomes clear. And that really emphasises the fact that maths is really a language to describe something that, that these mathematicians are working on. 
So that's it from our first day at the International Congress of Mathematicians in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Uh, we've really enjoyed talking to mathematicians so far. We've got a lot more people to talk to before the Congress is finished. So stay tuned for the next Plus podcast from Rio. Bye. Bye.